preaching through the book of Matthew, and we've come to Matthew 19. And this morning we're going to discuss or look at what the scriptures have to say about the issue of divorce, specifically Jesus' teaching on this particular issue. And I want to mention, begin by talking about two reasons this matters, two reasons this is very relevant to us today, okay? The first is rather obvious. We are a divorce-saturated culture, okay? The statistics vary from person to person and group to group, but generally it's held that 50% of those who are married end up getting divorced. It goes up to like 63% on the second marriage and 75% on the third marriage. So someone who gets divorced the first time is more than likely going to get divorced a second or third time. And those who are not divorced um, still look at it as something that is good and right and something that uh, our culture as a whole views it as a good thing. Something that is a ne maybe a necessary evil, but certainly our culture views it as something that uh, isn't a big deal. Um, when I don't know the latest statistics, but when Pastor MacArthur was preaching in the 80s, 38 states had no-fault divorce laws. It's probably higher now. I'd guess it's upwards of the 50 range. But 38 states had no-fault divorce laws. And that basically means I could take my wife down to the judge and say, hey, listen, I don't like her anymore. Can I get a new wife? And the judge would say, bam, sure, that's fine. Get a new wife. And you don't have to give a reason. You don't have to give a rhyme. You just have to decide you don't want to be married anymore. Okay? So the first reason this is relevant is because it is so prevalent. It is so prevalent and such a problem in our culture. But the second reason it's relevant is because now, because it is so prevalent in our culture, we have to decide are we going to go with the culture or are we going to go with the Bible. That's what we have to decide on this particular issue. Okay? We don't get to make up the rules. We don't get to decide this is right or that's right. I think this is right. I think this is wrong. We don't get to make up the rules. God makes the rules on everything, and God made the rules on this. And Jesus' teaching here is very hard for our culture to take. Very hard for our culture to take. So the question for us at Christ Church is, are we going to stand on God's word? Are we going to listen to what God's word says? Or are we going to assume that we know better than God does? And I hope you don't believe that you know better than God does. Okay. So those are the two reasons relevant. One, it's prevalent in our culture, and two, it gives us a chance to evaluate how sturdy we are standing on God's work, and we're going to do that or not. All right, so let's get into the text. I want to give you first some historical background that was in Roman, in Roman culture and Jewish culture at that time. I mentioned this a couple of sermons ago, but I'll mention it today. There were two groups in Roman culture, or Jewish culture, two different groups of Pharisees, and one group was very tight with their divorce laws, and one group was very loose with their divorce laws, okay? And the divorce laws for the very loose group was actually called any cause divorce. That was the name of it. So you could go to court and get a any cause divorce. It's like in documents, almost like we would say no fault divorce. So when the Pharisees ask in verse 3, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause or any reason, they are talking about a specific divorce proceeding. They're talking about this group of liberal Pharisees who said that you could divorce your wife for whatever reason you had in mind. She burns your toast, you can divorce her. She can't bear your children, you can divorce her. She looked uglier, uglier today than she did yesterday, you can divorce her. She puts on a few pounds, you can divorce her. Doesn't matter what it was. You could divorce your wife for literally any cause, okay? And that's a specific, remember that, that's a specific thing they're referring to there in chapter, in verse 3 of chapter 19. The other group held that you could divorce your wife for adultery. And that was basically it. Okay? That was basically it. Okay? Now, it's important to understand, in that culture, if somebody committed adultery, divorce was mandatory. Okay? It wasn't an option to not divorce your wife. Even in Roman culture, if you were a Roman, and forgive me for using this word, but if you were a Roman husband and your wife commits adultery and you refuse to divorce her, they would bring you to court on charges of being a pimp. Literally, that's what they would do. You're pimping out your wife. Okay, again, forgive me for using that particular term. I'm not sure how else to get that point across, okay? But in Roman culture, you had to divorce your wife if she committed adultery. There was no other option. And if you didn't, you could be brought to court because of the way you were, how you were acting, okay? So the adultery issue was never a question at this time. It was not a question at all. It was a fundamental assumption 
that if someone committed adultery, divorce was okay. All right? And of course, if you talk about these two different groups, the more liberal group was, of course, the more popular group, okay? The ones who would give divorce for any cause at all. They were definitely the more popular of the two groups. It's hard to say how rampant divorce was. When Pastor MacArthur preached his sermons, he said in there that divorce was really rampant at that time. I read more recent commentators, and they said it wasn't as rampant. It was easy, but it wasn't rampant. Um, the statistics seem to bear out that it was pretty prevalent. Um, Josephus, ancient church historian, got divorced, and he used the any cause divorce to get divorced. That's how he got divorced. Josephus also talked about a friend of his who was on his 25th marriage. 25. You think Elizabeth Taylor was bad. <laughs> it was 25th marriage, all right? So this was, so it was definitely around and definitely a problem in that age and in that culture, right? So that gives you some background to what Jesus is addressing here specifically. All right, so let's work through this passage here in Matthew 19. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. I don't want to say a whole lot about this verse, but just understand this marks a geographical transition. For Jesus. Galilee is gone and now he's heading down to Jerusalem. He's going to go kind of a roundabout way. But in chapter 21 he enters into Jerusalem. Okay, so this is the end of his ministry and the beginning of his trek towards the cross. And we'll get more into that as we move through the next few chapters. Multitudes were following him and healed them. And then the Pharisees also came up to him testing him. Notice that word. This is the <coughs> same word used of Satan. Okay, The Pharisees question is a devil's question. It is a devil's question. The Pharisees were men who wanted loopholes. They wanted an escape clause. And so they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And basically what they're doing is they're taking a stick and hitting a horn's nest. That's what they're doing. They want Jesus to get stung. And all throughout this passage, in fact, chapter, I think it's 22, is where this all comes down, where there's all these questions that they ask Jesus and Jesus keeps kicking them back to him. They ask him about Caesar. Is it render unto Caesar? They ask him about the resurrection and the man who has seven wives. They ask him all these questions. And finally, Jesus asks them a question and it shuts them up. Okay? So all throughout this latter part, they are trying to trick Jesus. And one interesting note here is they're in Herod's region. Remember what happened to John when he confronted Herod about his unlawful divorce? from his brother's wife, or his, or his unlawful divorce from his wife, and he was going to marry his brother's wife. Remember what happened to John? John got beheaded. So some people, that's not that far-fetched. Some people think the Pharisees here are trying to get Jesus to say something that will get him in political trouble, okay? that the Herod, Herod and those guys will come and arrest Jesus and behead him, just as they did with John. Okay, But what we see here in verse 3, is wickedness. This question, and this is so important for us to understand when we read this passage. The question by the Pharisees is, Jesus, what is the baseline minimum that can happen to me for me to get a divorce? That's what they're asking. They're not asking how they should love their wives. They're not asking how it should be from the beginning. They're asking, what is the baseline minimum thing I can do? Okay? Or she can do that I can get rid of her. Right? And this just shows, and this is why Jesus answers the way he does, this shows a hard heart by the Pharisees. And this is what we're going to see all throughout the continue as we go through Matthew. This is the wrong question. This is the wrong question to be asking. Okay, imagine a father comes to you and his son's um, you know, three years old, and he says, now, I just want to know what is the minimum thing he has to do for me to kick him out of the house? I mean, what is it? If he doesn't go chop the wood when I ask him to, can I boot him? You know, when he's 15, if he wrecks the car, can I kick him out? Can you, and you would say to that father, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you borrowing trouble like that? Why do you have this sort of approach of how can I get out of this particular scenario? Okay? And that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing here. So the Pharisees, instead of asking how should it be, how can I love my wife, how can I care for my wife, they're trying to find a loophole or give Jesus the sanction for them a loophole. Out of, their divorce, out of their marriages. And so the question, like I said at the beginning, is the devil's question. It's the devil's question. That's, what, that's who's asking that. And that's what the Pharisees are doing here. So it's, under, it's important to understand who asked the question here. These are not good guys. These are not people who are really interested in what the Bible has to say. Okay? These are men who probably have divorced their wives or want to divorce their wives, and they're looking for Jesus to give them a, a parachute, an ejection seat. 
Press this button, boom, you're out of it, okay? And that is why Jesus answers them the way he does in verses 4 through 6, okay? He answered and said to them, have you not read? To slap. Pharisees. Pharisees were the great readers of the Bible. They were the ones that knew the Bible. They memorized huge chunks of the Bible. And Jesus here isn't asking them, have you read that really obscure passage in Haggai? Jesus asked them, have you read Genesis 1 and 2? Okay? So he's giving them a really, this is, a, this is an insult to the Pharisees, and rightfully so. Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay? Jesus is laying down here the way it is supposed to be. Okay? And I mentioned this a couple of sermons ago. We talked about marriage. This is the way Jesus, God, wants it to work. And those who claim to love God, this is the way they should want it to work. Okay? And that is the problem with the Pharisees. The Pharisees claim to love God, claim to walk in his law, claim to want to do what he says, but they don't really want to do what he says. They don't really want to obey God's word. Okay? So Jesus brings us back to the basic fundamental scriptural teaching. And there's so much discussion in our culture about divorce that's easy to miss verses 4 through 6. It's easy just to scoot right down to verse 8 and 9 and say, okay, what are the exceptions? What are the exceptions? It's always a question you get, well, when can I? do that. What does a man have to do for me to leave? Or what does a woman have to do for me to leave? That's the fundamental question that people are asking. Well, that's not the question Jesus wants us to ask. That's a devil's question. The question Jesus wants us to ask is, how can we make ourselves one flesh and be joined together as husband and wife permanently? Okay? And I said this several weeks ago, the goal, the aim, the target is permanent marriage till death, man, one man, one woman. That's the goal. That's the aim. That's the way God created the world. Okay? That's the way he intends for it to work. If we sever a marriage bond, okay, when a man and woman are one flesh, it is like taking a buzz saw to them and cutting them in half, like some freakish horror show. That's what Jesus is saying here. Okay? So, verses 4 through 6 basically tell us that Jesus is saying divorce should be extremely rare and extremely difficult at best. Okay? At best. That is the liberal interpretation of this passage. Okay? That is the liberal interpretation. It should be very difficult and very hard to do and very rare. That's what he's saying. Even among pagans, I think he would argue that. All right? Even among pagans. So, so I, our questions have got to be the right questions. And this is, this is why we've got to, what is the right question? How can I make this function? How can I be, how can we be one flesh? How can we make sure we don't tear apart what God has joined together? Okay. And it's clear that Jesus here is emphasizing that particular point. That is his point. And that is what he wants us to hear. All right. So Jesus says, here's how it should be Pharisees. Here's how it should be one man, one woman, forever joined together, joined by God, do not separate. Okay? That's, that's the goal. But of course, the Pharisees want it out. Okay? The Pharisees want it out. And so they ask the question, well, Jesus, haven't you read what Moses said? This is almost like a comeback based on what Jesus said. Well, Moses, haven't you read what Moses said? Haven't you read what Moses said? Don't you know what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 24? <laughs> of course he knows. And Jesus says to him again, what? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Okay. So what is the cause of divorce here? What is Jesus saying to the Pharisees? He's saying your hard hearts are the reason Moses had to do that. Notice it says the hardness of your hearts, not their hearts back there, not those guys in Deuteronomy 24, but those you right now. You stand in front of me right now, Jesus is saying, you Pharisees, you are hard-hearted. Okay? And so I want to mention here two reasons, not good reasons, by the way, but two reasons people often get divorced. Let me mention a couple. We'll go back to Matthew 5 for the first one. If you'd like to flip back there, we can look at this together. And I'm going to start in verse 27, okay? because this is really where this section begins. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. 
But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman, and this is the exact same word for wife that we see later in Matthew 5. Exact same word. Okay, it's translated woman here, but it could just easily be translated wife, or the word wife could be translated woman. Okay, it's, it, it, there's a, the same word there. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, now this ties this in with what just came before. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who's divorced commits adultery. Jesus ties lust and divorce together like this. Why does a man say, I want to leave that woman? Well, usually because there's another woman. Maybe it's a real woman. Maybe it's a woman in his mind. It doesn't matter what it is. One of the fundamental motivations for divorce in our culture is lust. And we've got to understand, lust. Okay? Men leave their wives because they think there's somebody better on the other side. Maybe someone real, maybe their secretary, maybe somebody they met at work, maybe somebody they met down next door neighbor, it doesn't matter who it is, or it may just be somebody in their heart, they're like, I'm sure someone is better than this one. It may just be imaginary, a fantasy. The men divorce their wives for lust, and we try to, I mean, try to come up with all sorts of reasons, you know, all sorts of rhymes for these sort of things, why people do things, but Jesus nails it there. There's a reason he follows the teaching on lust with the teaching on divorce, because those two things go together all right and let me just say a word to the men here if you want to keep your marriage in a way that pleases the lord make sure you keep your heart and your mind and your body fixed on your wife and on no one else okay on no one else there. all right the second reason so first reason is lust the second reason is what jesus mentions here in matthew 19 and that is hardness of heart okay why was that there in deuteronomy 24 and the reason is because your hearts are hard and the implication is, if you did not have hard hearts, you would not have to worry about this. That's what Jesus is saying. If you didn't have hard hearts, Pharisees, you would not have to worry about divorce. You wouldn't have to be asking this question. Okay? So those are just a couple reasons. There's other reasons for divorce in the scriptures. Uh, illegitimate reasons, but there's other reasons in there as well. Okay. Let me give you a couple more things, and I'll get into some, some specifics here in a moment. Um, verse 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Okay? This is an important verse. Okay? This is an important verse. Because what it's saying is any time there's a divorce that is illegitimate and the person remarries, it is an adulterous relationship. It is an adulterous relationship. All right? And again, I'm going to quote Pastor MacArthur here. Pastor MacArthur says that what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here is you are going out and you are creating a culture of adultery. That is what you're doing. By your easy divorce laws, by your any cause divorce, you are going out and creating a culture of adultery. You are making the, the women especially, I think the women especially here, because men could go off and get jobs and do those things, but a woman in this culture really had to get remarried. She really had to to survive, or she had to become a prostitute. Those were kind of your two options. I said this before. Okay? So what, what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is because of your easy divorce laws, because you were allowing men off the hook so easily, you were forcing all these women into adulterous relationships. And that word there is passive. Okay, now I don't know how much, you, how much language you guys know, but commits adultery is a passive word. You cause her to commit adultery is the idea of the phrase. Okay. By an illegitimate divorce, you cause her to commit adultery. So the emphasis there is not on the woman who goes out and commits adultery, although she does. The emphasis is on the cause of that, and that is these men who have this light, soft divorce law. Okay? They go out and commit adultery. All right? Or cause their, these wives to go out and commit adultery. Okay. So just walking through the passage, we see here that the emphasis for Jesus is on one man, one woman, joined together, one flesh, and that's the way it's supposed to be till the end of time, till one of them is laid in the grave. That is the way it's supposed to be. And those of you who, are, who want to get married, who are thinking about getting married, remember this point, okay? In God's economy, there is no escape clause. Okay? There is no escape clause. Now, that doesn't mean you want to be paralyzed with fear, but you want to be 
wise. Okay, you want to be wise, and whether it's a woman or a man, who um, whoever's getting married there, you want to make sure that this is somebody you feel like you can live with till they're dead. Okay, not till you kill them. <laughs> till they're dead. All right, till they're dead, and it's all it's all said and done. Okay, so you got to understand this is the point that Jesus is making. This is the main point. This permanent of marriage. Now, what do we do with the exception clause in verse nine? Okay, let's talk about this briefly. This is, this is the most controversial part of this passage. Okay? The most controversial part is what exactly is Jesus saying when he says, except for sexual immorality? A man cannot divorce his wife except for sexual immorality. And I, by the way, what applies to the man here would apply to the woman as well. Okay? A woman cannot divorce his, his, her husband except for sexual immorality. All right? So what, what is Jesus talking about here? Some men argue that this is talking about sexual relations before marriage, and that's it. Because the word there is pornea, which means fornication, okay? And fornication technically is not adultery. Fornication is premarital sex, okay? That's what fornication is. And so some argue here that that is not, this passage is saying, unless you find out that she slept around beforehand and you didn't know it or something, then you can't divorce your wife. And a lot of people limit this to the betrothal period. Okay, so just during the betrothal period, like Joseph in Matthew chapter 9, just during the betrothal period, you can divorce her for sexual immorality, but after you get married, you can't. Okay, that would be the argument there. Okay? And there are very good men who believe this, and that's a, pro that's a possible interpretation of this passage. I do not think it's the probable interpretation of this passage, however. The word pornea throughout the New Testament can mean fornication, but it can also mean a whole host of other things. Okay? For example, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, it says... The sexually immoral will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the word adultery is not used in that passage at all. Right? Now, is John just talking about those who have premarital sex? No, I think he's using sexual immorality there to mean the whole, all sexual sin. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul uses sex, this term to describe what happened when the ladies of Moab, in Genesis, I mean, sorry, Numbers, I want to say 25, when the ladies of Moab came and slept with the men of Israel. Okay? And again, you're not talking about a bunch of men who weren't married. Paul used the word, word sexual morality there, and there it clearly means adultery. Okay? So think here Jesus is saying there's a broad range of sexual sins that could cause someone to get a divorce. All right? A broad range of sexual sins. And why would this be an exception? And let's ask ourselves, why would this be an exception? Why not something else? Why does he make this point? Well, because the sexual union is at the very center of the husband-wife relationship. It's at the very middle of it. Some commentators would even say it is the covenant sign of the marital union. Okay? My wife had a friend when she was, from when she was growing up who she got married and her husband refused to consummate the marriage. He refused to consummate the marriage. Well, what happens in that case? Well, besides... Everyone thinks, what is he doing? <laughs> Refusing to consummate the marriage is, it's a no. It doesn't count. Why doesn't it count? The vows were said. The wedding was gone through. They exchanged rings. Why doesn't it count? Well, because that sexual union is at the very center of the marriage relationship. And when that's, that union right there is profaned, I believe it dissolves the marriage bond or can dissolve the marriage bond. All right? Let me give you one other verse here. From well, I'll give you several in a minute. But 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is talking about... I'm try, I've tried in this sermon. We have to discuss a lot, of, a lot of touchy issues here as far as sexual stuff goes. So I'm trying to be here as gracious as I can be, as gentle as I can be. Um, hopefully none of the kids are going home and like, Dad, now what is sexual union? That could be a, a, little, awkward, a little awkward there. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 6, notice what Paul says here. I'm looking at verse 16. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Okay, this is an important verse. Because what it's saying is if a man goes and sleeps with a prostitute, he has become one flesh with that prostitute. And I think the point Paul is making in this passage is that severs, or could, I, I put it in a, in a possible, sever the marriage bond because of how intimate that union is when someone decides to defile that particular part of the marital relationship. They have said, we're done with our covenant vows, and they've broken their covenant vow. Okay? So that's why this exception 
is important, and that's why it's there. Because sexual immorality strikes at the very heart of the marriage union. And if someone refuses, or someone refuses, someone goes and commits sexual immorality, they have themselves turned their back on their wife or husband and committed a sin, which could, it doesn't have to, but could sever the marriage bonds. Okay, so let me get to a few specifics here um, about divorce and remarriage, and then I'll give some application at the end, okay? First of all, so where, where is divorce permitted? Okay, where, biblically, where is it permitted? And the danger here is that we draw the circle so, we have drawn the circle so big. There's so many things, even Christians. There's so many things that we put into that circle. But scripturally, it is not a big circle. There is not much that fits into the category of that is a divorceable offense. Very small, very slim things fit in there. Okay? And the first one, obviously, I've mentioned already, is sexual immorality. This would include homosexuality, adultery, refusal, a refusal to sleep with the wife is a form of sexual immorality. And I think if you continue to do that, it's a divorceable offense. Okay? Sexual molestation of children, sleeping with prostitutes, and whatever else you can think of out there sexually. Okay? Now what about pornography? This is an important question. If a man has a very bad porn habit, is that a divorceable offense? I think in some cases it could be. Certainly in some cases it could be. But it would have to be after a long, long time of trying to deal with it. Um, adultery and looking at girls on the web are not the equivalent in the, in the sin sense. Okay? Now, obviously, Jesus says they're both adultery. But you can't divorce for lust. Okay? You can't divorce for lust. You have to divorce for action. All right? And that, I think, is the key thing. There has to be concrete actions that the man or woman has committed that give them, the that, that we can say, that is sexual morality. And that was sin. Okay? All right, so that's the first exception, if you will, or the first permission the second would be abandonment. And I, didn't, I don't want to get too much into 1 Corinthians 7. I was tempted to spend another sermon next week on this, but I just said I'll get to 1 Corinthians eventually, and if you guys are still here, you can hear my exposition of 1 Corinthians 7 when I get to 1 Corinthians 7. But let's look briefly at that, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Paul says, Now to the married I command you, not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Paul is reiterating or re-saying what, exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19 and Luke 10. He's saying the exact same thing. Okay, he's talking about two Christians who are married. And here he, he says, if you're talking about two Christians who are married. Divorce is not even an option. That's basically what he's saying right there. It's not even an option. Because one, if a man does commit a sin, he should repent and turn from it, and the, and the wife should forgive him. But even beyond that, if it does lead to divorce, the woman is, or the man, whoever it is, is to remain unmarried in that situation. Okay? All right, so that's what he's talking about. So, but 10 and 11 are a restatement of Jesus' teaching. Now verse 12, he goes on to something else. But to the rest, I, not the Lord. In other words, this isn't what Jesus taught. I'm not contradicting Jesus not contradicting Jesus. He's saying this is a situation that Jesus didn't deal with. Okay? But to the rest, not I, the rest I, not the Lord, say if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children will be unclean, but now they are holy. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know a wife whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? Okay, so Paul is in a very different scenario here than Jesus was. Jesus was dealing with people in the covenant, people who claimed to love God, people who went to the temple and the synagogue every week, people who read their scrolls, okay? That's who Jesus was dealing with. Well, at Corinth, you had all these people coming to Jesus who their spouses didn't believe. What are we supposed to do, Paul? Are we just supposed to jump ship? Shall I leave them? Are they going to make me unclean if I stay with this unbelieving spouse? Okay? And Paul says, no. Paul says, no. And like I said earlier, this is a direct shift from the Old Testament teaching in Ezra 9 and 10. A direct shift. 
Remember Ezra 9 and 10? Where, there was a she where they got rid of those wives. Well, here he's saying you don't have to do that anymore. Why? Because the cleanness flows out from you instead of you being defiled. And this we see with Jesus. In the Old Testament, you touch a leper, you're unclean. In the New Testament, you touch a leper and the leper becomes clean. Okay? So this is part of what's happening in this passage. So Paul is telling them, listen, don't worry about living with an unbelief. Don't worry about it. Okay? You're not going to be unclean. You're going to be able to worship. You're going to be fine. Your children are going to be clean. Okay? Don't worry about that. All right? Now, if the unbeliever refuses to live with you, if he abandons you and leaves you, then you can depart and you can be in peace. Okay? And I think Paul is saying there remarriage is permissible. Okay, I'll get to that. I'm jumping ahead. But so this, this is the abandonment or desertion idea. This has become a huge bucket that people dump all sorts of stuff into, and that's just not right. Okay? The abandonment idea here is very clear and precise. Let me tell you where Paul is getting this from, I believe. Exodus 21. Paul, Exodus, Exodus 21, verses 7 through 11. I won't read you the whole passage. But basically, Paul is saying if a man takes a second wife, he cannot deprive his first wife of certain basic things. That's what Paul is, or Moses is saying. Okay? And this is what it says. If he has betrothed her, okay, if he takes another wife, verse 10, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marriage rights. Marriage rights there means the marriage bed. Okay, so there's three things here that constitute abandonment. A refusal to feed, a refusal to close, and a refusal to be faithful sexually or to, or to do what you should do sexually. Okay? So abandonment is not this big, huge, catch-all category that anything we like can fit into. Okay? That's not what that is. And even, let me make this point as well, even if the person is an unbeliever, the believer does not have permission to divorce unless the unbeliever refuses to live with them. Okay? Refuses. And this is exactly what we see in 1 Peter 3. Let me throw one more verse at you here. 1 Peter chapter 3. Talking to the wives. It says, wives. This is verses 3, 1 and 2. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husband, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. In other words, Peter is saying the exact same thing Paul is saying. Just because you're leaving, living with an unbeliever doesn't mean you jump ship. You stay there, you're faithful, you honor Jesus, you obey God's word, and you trust that God is going to work in that situation, okay? So there is a category of a desertion. It is a, just like sexual morality, it is a small category. We can't fit into it whatever we want to fit into it. We have to fit into it, what Paul is talking about. And Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 7, a refusal by the unbeliever to provide the most basic rights to the believer. Okay? And if the unbeliever refuses to do that, then the believer has the right to leave in peace. Okay. So first, sexual immorality. Second, desertion or abandonment by an unbeliever. And I'll add one third category here. This is a little muddy in my mind. I'm not exactly sure how to fit it all together. But I would just say, if something was worthy of the death penalty in the Old Testament, then we may want to think about that as a divorceable offense. Okay. Now, this is not a long list. There's things on there. Most of them would fit into sexual immorality and abandonment category anyway. Okay, most of it would fit in there anyway. But there are some things. If your husband decides to shoot the next door neighbor in the head and kill him, well, that's not sexual morality. And I guess technically it's not desertion, but it might be a divorceable offense. Okay, and I'm, I haven't worked that out entirely. Pastor Doug Wilson has walked through that a little bit, and I think it's something we need to consider, um, especially since we don't see the death penalty in the New Testament for crimes that we would in the Old Testament. Is divorce a legitimate out for that? And I think in some cases it is, a lot of cases. Kidnapping, um, murder, things like that, okay? So where is divorce permitted? Sexual immorality, abandonment, or desertion, and possible death penalty offenses. And that's it. That's it. I mean, that's it. That's what the Bible says, that there's nothing else there, okay? That, that's, that's the end of it as far as the, that passage goes. Okay, now what about remarriage? give you a couple of points on this. And again, this is where it's really tricky. Because this is where there's the most complications. So I can't go into all the possible scenarios. Let me give you some basic principles, okay? Where divorce is biblical, then remarriage is as well. That's, that's what I feel like the scriptures teach. That's what I think 1 Corinthians 7 teach. If one of those reasons I just mentioned is the reason for the divorce, then remarriage is legitimate. Okay. That would be the way I would take it. Where the divorce was not biblical, then remarriage is adultery and should not be pursued. 
Okay. Where the divorce is not biblical, remarriage is adultery and should not be pursued. Okay. And third, if the initial divorce was wrong and somebody is already remarried, what do we do then? I mean, this is kind of a messy situation. You know, here back here, somebody left or left got divorced because of some minor reason, you know, burnt toast, whatever. And now this person is remarried. What do we do there? Okay, well, I think if the person's a Christian, we tell them that's a sin, they need to confess that sin, but we don't try to undo anything. Um, that's just a mess. You're just creating another problem. So if someone is remarried, now it may keep them out of certain positions of leadership. I think First Timothy 3 excludes a man who's been divorced illegitimately, a Christian man, from pursuing office. There's other things there as well, okay? But if the divorce was wrong, but somebody's already remarried, we can't go back and turn back the clock and get it back to where it was. That's foolish, okay? That person does need to repent and turn from their sin, but it does not mean that um, we have to try to undo the marriage. Right? And there are so many possible scenarios. You know, some of your products, well, now what about this pastor? If this person came to you and this person came to you and they had both been divorced and they want to get remarried, what would you do? You know, if this happens and this happens, what would you do? And there's all, I mean, the scenarios are endless, absolutely endless. And I'll just tell you, I'm going to, these are the principles that the scriptures teach, and these are the ones I'm going to stand on. And as situations arise, we will address those one by one. So if someone came to me and they had been divorced, they wanted to remarry, I would address that at that point in time and take Dr. Moss and I, and we would take into consideration the various circumstances around that. Okay, I'm not going to say we wouldn't remarry. I'm not going to say we will remarry. I'm going to say when the situation arises, we'll deal with that. Okay? So divorce is biblical. Remarriage is as well. Divorce is not biblical. Remarriage is adultery and should not be pursued. Okay? Should not be pursued at all. And I guess, though, I should add there, if the other spouse gets remarried again, then a lot of people feel like then you could go and remarry. All right? So even if the divorce was not biblical, if your spouse had divorced you, gets remarried, then you could go to be remarried as well. Now there's debate about that as well. Some people don't think that's the case. And then finally, if divorce was wrong and remarriage has already occurred, you should take it as it is and ask the people to confess their sin and move on. Okay, now I want to finish with three applications. I know that's a lot of information. I know it's a lot of information. If you have questions about it, feel free to talk to me after the service or email me or whatever, call me. Okay, but that is the scriptural teaching. That's, that's the consistent teaching of the New Testament that marriage is supposed to be permanent. Notice the disciples' reaction if you're still in Matthew 19. Verse 10, the disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. <laughs> the disciples were like, what on earth, Jesus? I mean, this is so hard. How can we possibly do this? It's better just not even to worry about it. Okay? And they're going to say something later with the rich young ruler, the same thing. Where they say, if he can't be saved, who can be? You know, it's impossible. Okay? And I think Jesus' answer there is the same answer here. First he says, well, you can't do that. Some people have the gift and some people don't. Okay, verses 11 through um, 11 and 12. Some people have the gift of singleness or celibacy, and some people do not have the gift of celibacy. Make sure you don't jump into the celibacy category when you don't have it. Okay, that's bad news for you. All right? But I think what also what Jesus is saying here is he, remember, this is coming from Jesus. Jesus, it, it can feel impossible to make it through. And there's no doubt about it. We've been there, my wife and I have been there, lots of you have been there, where the tension, the pain, the difficulty is so hard, and you say to yourself, it probably would have been better if I had just not married at all. Okay. What Jesus is saying here, he's saying to his disciples, I can sustain you. That's what Jesus is saying. I can sustain you. I can do this. With God, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So the first thing I want to tell you this morning is, if we want to have marriages that honor Christ, we have to lean upon Jesus. We have to trust in Jesus. We have to need Jesus Christ. Marriages cannot be sustained without Jesus. They cannot be sustained without grace and mercy and love for God's word. So the first point I want to make as far as application goes is Jesus needs to be at the center of your marriage. He needs to be the one you're pursuing. He needs to be the one you love. He needs to be the one you're obeying, you're trusting in. Okay. The second thing is we need to have compassion on those who are in difficult marriages but not compromise God's work. 
We need to have compassion on those, and there's lots of those. And there's lots of those. We, are, we know family members who are in very difficult marriages. We know others who are in very difficult marriages. But the question here is not how hard it is. The question is what does God's word give us permission to do? And that is always the question. What does God's word say? Okay. But we don't need to be hard about it. We just need to be firm and gracious. And loving those around us means loving Jesus more than those around us. And loving what Jesus said more than we love those around us. Okay. So we need to be compassionate on those who are in difficult marriages. Third, and finally, there is grace and forgiveness for those who are divorced. Okay, and this is important. Divorce is not the unforgivable offense. Divorce is not something that no one can ever recover from. Divorce is not something that puts a, a red D, you know, like the red A that, uh, that the lady in Nathaniel Hawthorne's had to wear, where it doesn't put a red D on you that you have to wear around your whole life. That's not what divorce is. And as Christians, we can be tempted to do that because we know how, how, how ugly it is and how painful it is and how much trouble it stirs up. But there's grace and forgiveness for those who are divorced. There's grace and forgiveness for those who are divorced five times. There's grace and forgiveness for those men who committed adultery on their wives and their wives divorced them. There's grace and forgiveness for that. Okay? Jesus can forgive you and Jesus can bring healing to that situation. All right? So in our own marriages, we need to put Jesus at the center. When we're discussing hard situations with people, we need to put Jesus at the center. And when people come to us who have sinned greatly, we need to put Jesus at the center and say, this is what Jesus says. Jesus loves you, confess your sins, and forgive you your sins. Okay? This is a hard teaching. I think especially in our culture, it's a hard teaching. But this is what the scriptures teach. This is what Jesus says. This is what Paul says. This is what the Old Testament says. And we cannot bend from it. And we must not if we're going to love God and love those around us. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word to us. It is hard and difficult in a lot of ways, especially in our culture. I ask that you would give all of us wisdom as we interact with family members and friends and neighbors who are divorced, who are thinking about divorces, who are going through divorces. Um, help us to have the right measure of compassion without compromise. Uh, but I pray especially for our marriages. We know, Lord, that we are sinners, every last one of us, and that we do things that we shouldn't, that we sin against one another, we hurt one another. We ask that your Son and your Spirit would help our marriages to thrive, help us to be a faithful picture of Jesus and his church. We thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us without a word on this mess, without a word on this issue, but you have given us a good word. Help us to bend our knee to it now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.